Hey folks, I'm excited to share some stories with you today that I've written myself. Whether you're a long-time follower or just joining us, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these tales. Don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe if you're new here. Let's dive in and I hope you enjoy. I found a time traveler on the dark web you won't believe what he told me. I've always been a curious guy, the kind who can't leave a mystery unsolved. My curiosity has often gotten me into trouble, but nothing like what I experienced last year. It all started when I was browsing the dark web. Yeah, I know, it's a sketchy place. But you hear stories, you know? Stories about hidden knowledge, weird experiments, and sometimes, you just want to see for yourself. This time, my curiosity led me to something I wish I could erase from my mind forever. I was clicking through random forums and marketplaces, most of them selling drugs, fake IDs, and other illegal crap. Then I stumbled upon a thread titled, Time Travel Proof and Discussion. It had a surprisingly large number of comments for something that seemed so ridiculous. Most of the replies were jokes or trolls, but one comment caught my eye. It was from a user named Chrono Savant. I am a time traveler, AMA. Of course, I laughed it off at first, but then I noticed his replies were detailed, not just the usual vague crap you'd expect. He talked about future events with specific dates and described technological advancements that seemed too precise to be mere guesses. My curiosity piqued, I sent him a private message, half expecting to be ignored or scammed. To my surprise, he replied almost immediately. The message was simple. You have questions, I have answers, let's talk. I was skeptical, but intrigued. We moved our conversation to a more secure platform using encrypted messaging. It started as a normal chat, with me asking about future tech, world events, and other trivial stuff. His answers were convincing, but I still wasn't entirely sold. Then he told me something that changed everything. Do you want proof? He asked. Of course, I replied. Anyone can make up stories. Fine, tomorrow at exactly 3.45 p.m., there will be a power outage in your area. It will last for seven minutes. I live in a pretty stable neighborhood. Power outages are rare, so I thought this was a good test. The next day, I waited. At exactly 3.45 p.m., the lights flickered and went out. My heart raced as I stared at the clock, counting the minutes. Exactly seven minutes later, the power came back on. I was hooked. I had to know more. I messaged him immediately. How did you know that? I told you, I'm a time traveler, he replied. But that's just the beginning. If you really want to understand, you need to see it for yourself. Meet me. Alarm bells went off in my head. Meeting someone from the dark web, it sounded insane. But I was too deep now, too curious to back out. We arranged to meet in a public place, a coffee shop downtown. He said he'd be wearing a red scarf. When I arrived, my nerves were on edge. The place was crowded, but I spotted him right away. A middle-aged man, maybe in his early forties, with a rugged look and a red scarf around his neck. He looked normal, too normal. I sat down across from him, my mind racing with questions. He introduced himself as Daniel and started talking, his voice calm and composed. He explained that he was from the year 2098 and had been sent back to study the past. Time travel, he said, was still experimental and dangerous, but it was real. I asked him about the future and he told me about advances in technology, changes in politics and even major disasters that hadn't happened yet. But then, his expression darkened. 
He leaned in closer and lowered his voice. There's something else, he said. Something you need to know. The future is not what you think. It's dark. I felt a chill run down my spine. He started to describe things that sounded like they were straight out of a dystopian novel. Government control was absolute. Privacy was non-existent. And humanity was on the brink of collapse due to climate disasters and endless wars. But that wasn't the worst part. There's a project, he said looking around nervously. It's called Eclipse. It's designed to control the population, to keep people in line. They're using advanced AI and mind control techniques. People think they're free, but they're not. Every thought, every action is monitored and controlled. I could feel my hands trembling as he spoke. It sounded like a nightmare, but his eyes, there was something in his eyes that made me believe him. A deep-seated fear that couldn't be faked. Why are you telling me this? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Because you need to know, he replied. The only way to stop it is to prevent it from ever happening. You have to spread the word. Make people aware before it's too late. I left the coffee shop in a daze, my mind spinning with everything he had told me. It felt like I was living in a different reality, one where the future was already written, and it was up to me to change it. I knew it sounded crazy, but I couldn't shake the feeling that everything he said was true. Over the next few days, I started digging. I looked for any mention of Project Eclipse, any signs that what he said was happening. I found nothing at first just conspiracy theories and wild speculation. But then, I noticed something strange. My computer started acting up, files disappearing, and messages being deleted. It felt like someone was watching me, trying to stop me from uncovering the truth. One night, as I was going through some old forums, I received a message from Daniel. They know. Be careful. My heart raced. Who knew? What was he talking about? Before I could reply, the message disappeared. I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead. This was getting too real, too dangerous. That's when the real nightmare began. After Daniel's cryptic message, I started to notice things that made my paranoia skyrocket. My phone would ring once and then stop. No number displayed. Shadows outside my window at night seemed to linger longer than usual. I began seeing the same cars parked near my house at odd hours. I tried to rationalize it, telling myself it was just my mind playing tricks. But deep down, I knew something was off. I decided to confront Daniel again. We arranged another meeting, this time in a more secluded park away from prying eyes. When I arrived, I found him sitting on a bench, looking more haggard than before. As soon as I sat down, he started speaking in a low, urgent tone. They're on to you, he said. You need to be very careful. They've started monitoring your activities. Who are they? I demanded, frustration and fear creeping into my voice. Eclipse. The organization behind the project. They've been watching for any disruptions to their plans. Your search for information has flagged you as a potential threat. I was about to ask more when he shoved a small USB drive into my hand. This contains everything you need to know. But be warned, once you see what's on here, there's no going back. They'll stop at nothing to silence you. I left the park feeling more anxious than ever, constantly looking over my shoulder. When I got home, I locked all my doors and windows before plugging the USB drive into my laptop. It contained a single folder labeled Eclipse. Inside were dozens of documents, video files, and images. I started with a document titled 
Project Overview. The document detailed a series of covert operations designed to subjugate the population through technology and psychological manipulation. It talked about implanting chips in people's brains to monitor and control their thoughts, using advanced AI to predict and alter human behavior, and even experimenting with bioweapons to thin out the population. One file stood out, test subjects. I opened it to find a list of names, dates, and outcomes of various experiments. The descriptions were horrifying, people being driven insane by voices in their heads, forced to commit unspeakable acts, or simply dropping dead from unexplained causes. I felt sick to my stomach. The videos were worse. They showed real footage of these experiments. People strapped to chairs, screaming, begging for mercy, as scientists in lab coats observed without emotion. The level of inhumanity was beyond comprehension. One video caught my attention more than the others. It showed a man, probably in his thirties, sitting calmly at first. But as the minutes passed, his demeanor changed. He started twitching, then screaming, clawing at his own skin, as if trying to tear something out. The scientist watched, taking notes, unaffected by his agony. The video ended abruptly, leaving his fate unknown. As I delved deeper, I realized that Project Eclipse wasn't just a future threat. It was already happening. Governments and corporations were involved, using these technologies under the guise of public safety and national security. The implications were terrifying. I felt a cold dread settle over me. Daniel was right. This was too big for one person to handle. But I couldn't just sit back and do nothing. I had to find a way to expose this, to warn people before it was too late. Over the next few days, I tried to contact journalists, activists, anyone who might be able to help. Most of them dismissed me as a conspiracy nut. The few who seemed interested suddenly stopped responding after a while. My emails bounced back. Phone numbers were disconnected. It was as if they had disappeared off the face of the earth. One night, as I was combing through the documents again, my computer screen flickered. A message popped up. We warned you. Before I could react, my laptop shut down. I tried to restart it, but it was dead. Panic set in. I grabbed my phone but it wouldn't turn on either. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized the full extent of their reach. They could get to me anytime, anywhere. That night, I barely slept. Every sound, every creak of the house sent me into a frenzy of fear. I kept expecting men in black suits to kick down my door and drag me away, but no one came. Not that night, at least. The next day, I decided to take drastic measures. I packed a bag with essentials, grabbed some cash, and left town. I needed to lay low to figure out my next move without them tracking me. I found a cheap motel a few towns over and checked in under a fake name. It wasn't much, but it felt safer than staying at home. For the next few days, I lived like a ghost, constantly moving never staying in one place for too long. I used public libraries to access the internet, always looking over my shoulder. I tried to contact Daniel, but he had gone dark. It was as if he never existed. One evening, as I was sitting in a dingy motel room, there was a knock on the door. My heart stopped. I approached the door cautiously, peeking through the peephole. It was a woman maybe in her late twenties, looking nervous. She glanced around before knocking again. Who is it? I called out, trying to keep my voice steady. I'm a friend of Daniel's, she replied. He sent me to find you. Against my better judgment, I opened the door. She slipped inside quickly, 
glancing around as if expecting to be followed. We don't have much time, she said. They're close. Daniel sent me to help you. My name is Sarah. I was skeptical, but her eyes held the same fear I'd seen in Daniel's. She handed me another USB drive. This has the latest intel, she explained. Daniel's been compromised. We need to move fast if we're going to stop this. I took the drive, feeling a mixture of relief and dread. Sarah seemed genuine, but trust was a luxury I couldn't afford. Still, I had no other options. As we sat down to go through the new files, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The air was thick with tension, and every sound outside made us jump. We were in a race against time, fighting an enemy that was always one step ahead. The drive contained more details about Project Eclipse, including locations of hidden facilities and names of key players involved. It was our first real lead, but it also meant we were in deeper than ever. As we planned our next move, Sarah looked at me with a mix of determination and fear. We can do this, she said. We have to. The future depends on it. But deep down, I wondered if we were already too late. The shadows of Project Eclipse loomed large, and the closer we got to the truth, the more dangerous our lives became. Sarah and I decided our best bet was to expose Project Eclipse by gathering undeniable proof and leaking it to the public. But to do that, we needed to get inside one of their facilities. According to the files, there was a testing site not too far from where we were hiding. It was risky, but we had no choice. We spent the next few days gathering supplies and planning our infiltration. Sarah was surprisingly resourceful, having been involved in underground activism for years. She managed to get us fake IDs and uniforms that would allow us to pose as employees. The plan was simple. Get in, gather evidence, get out. The night of the operation, we drove to the facility in a stolen van, parking a safe distance away. The building was nondescript, blending in with the industrial park around it. We approached cautiously, nerves on edge, and managed to bypass the outer security with the fake IDs. Inside, the atmosphere was sterile and oppressive, the fluorescent lights casting an eerie glow. We split up, agreeing to meet back at the entrance in an hour. I headed towards the labs while Sarah went to the records room. As I walked through the corridors, I saw rooms filled with high-tech equipment and people working in silence. They barely glanced at me, too absorbed in their tasks. My heart pounded as I finally found what I was looking for, the main lab. Slipping inside, I began searching for anything that could serve as evidence. My eyes fell on a row of filing cabinets and a computer terminal. I started with the cabinets, pulling out files filled with reports on their experiments. The details were horrifying, people being subjected to mental and physical torture, their reactions meticulously documented. I snapped pictures of everything with my phone, my hands shaking. Then I moved to the computer, hoping to find digital records. After a few minutes of searching, I hit the jackpot, a folder labeled Eclipse Protocols. I plugged in the USB drive and started copying the files. As the progress bar inched forward, I heard footsteps approaching. Panicking, I hid behind a cabinet just as the door opened. Two men walked in, talking in low voices. They were discussing a new phase of the project, something called Operation Synthesis. From what I could gather, it involved mass deployment of their mind control technology. My blood ran cold. This was bigger than I'd imagined. The men eventually left and I finished copying the files, my heart racing. 
I slipped out of the lab and headed back to the entrance, praying Sarah had been successful too. When I reached our meeting point, she was already there, a look of grim determination on her face. Did you get it? She asked. I nodded, showing her the USB drive. And you? I found the main server room, she replied. Downloaded as much as I could. We need to go now. We hurried out of the building, every second feeling like an eternity. As we reached the van and sped away, I felt a mixture of relief and dread. We had the evidence, but we were now prime targets. Back at the motel, we went through the files together. The information was damning. Detailed plans, experiment logs, videos of test subjects. But the most chilling part was the scale of it. They had facilities all over the country, and their reach extended into every aspect of society. Politicians, media, tech companies, all were complicit. We decided to make multiple copies of the files and send them to trusted journalists, activists, and even upload them to the dark web. The goal was to create a storm of information that Eclipse couldn't contain. But just as we were about to start, the motel's power went out. The room plunged into darkness and a cold wave of fear washed over me. Sarah, we need to leave. I whispered, reaching for my bag. Before we could move, the door burst open and men in tactical gear stormed in. They moved with military precision, guns trained on us. There was no time to react. They grabbed us and everything went black. When I came to, I was in a small dimly lit room. My hands were cuffed to a metal chair and my head throbbed. Sarah was nowhere to be seen. Panic set in, but before I could process what was happening, the door opened and a man walked in. He was dressed in a suit with an air of authority that made my skin crawl. Mr. Anderson, he said, sitting down across from me. We finally meet. Who are you? I demanded, my voice shaking. You can call me Mr. Black, he replied, a cold smile playing on his lips. I'm here to discuss your recent activities. I glared at him, trying to mask my fear. What do you want? It's simple, he said, leaning forward. We want the files you stole, and we want to know who else you've shared them with. I remained silent, my mind racing. If I gave up the information, it was over. But if I didn't, they would undoubtedly make me suffer. Mr. Black sighed as if reading my thoughts. You're not leaving this room until we get what we want. And trust me, we have all the time in the world. The door opened again and two men walked in, carrying a tray of sinister looking tools. My blood ran cold. They were going to torture me. Hours blurred into days as they used every method imaginable to break me. But I held on clinging to the hope that Sarah had escaped and managed to get the files out. My resolve was tested to its limits, but I didn't give in. Then one day, the torture stopped. They left me alone in the room, broken and battered. Time passed, in a haze, until the door creaked open again. To my shock, it was Sarah. She looked rough, but alive. We're getting out of here, she whispered, unlocking my cuffs. How? I croaked, barely able to speak. I made a deal, she replied, helping me to my feet. We don't have much time. She led me through a maze of corridors until we reached a back exit. The fresh air hit me like a shock as we stumbled outside. We had escaped, but I knew it was only temporary. Eclipse wouldn't let us go that easily. As we drove away, Sarah filled me in. She had managed to send the files to a contact before she was captured. The information was out there, but we were still in danger. We needed to disappear, to go off the grid until the storm blew over. The reality of our situation sank in. We were fugitives now, 
constantly running, constantly hiding, but at least we had struck a blow against Eclipse. It wasn't over, but it was a start, and so we vanished, blending into the shadows, always watching our backs. The fight against Eclipse had only just begun, and we were determined to see it through, no matter the cost. Living off the grid was a lot harder than I'd imagined. Sarah and I moved constantly, never staying in one place for more than a few days. We used cash only, avoided technology, and stayed away from crowded areas. It felt like we were ghosts, existing only in the peripheries of society. Our days were filled with paranoia and vigilance. Every stranger was a potential threat every shadow a possible enemy. We communicated with our contacts through dead drops and coded messages, always careful not to leave a trail. The stress was relentless, but the thought of Project Eclipse kept us going. We couldn't let our guard down, not for a second. One evening, while staying in a rundown cabin in the mountains, Sara and I had a rare moment of peace we sat by the fire, eating canned soup and reflecting on everything that had happened. Do you think we'll ever be able to stop running? I asked, staring into the flames. Sarah sighed, her eyes distant. I don't know, but we can't give up. Eclipse is too dangerous. If we don't fight them, who will? Her determination was inspiring, but I could see the exhaustion in her eyes. We were both worn out, but the fear of Eclipse kept us going. That night, I barely slept, haunted by nightmares of the torture room and Mr. Black's cold smile. A few days later, we received a coded message from one of our contacts. It contained a location and a single word, safe house. We were skeptical, but we had no other options. We needed a place to regroup to plan our next move. The safe house was a dilapidated farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. It looked abandoned, but when we approached, a man stepped out, waving us inside. He introduced himself as David, a former journalist who had been tracking Eclipse for years. He had been living off the grid, much like us, after publishing an expose that got too close to the truth. Welcome to the resistance, he said with a grim smile. The safe house was stocked with supplies and equipment, and David had set up a makeshift command center in the basement. He showed us a map marked with the locations of known Eclipse facilities, as well as information on key personnel involved in the project. We've been gathering intel for months, he explained. There's a network of people like us working to expose Eclipse and bring them down. But we need more evidence, more proof. I showed him the files we had and his eyes widened. This is incredible, he said. With this, we can make a real impact, but we need to get it to the right people. Over the next few weeks, we worked with David and his network, planning a coordinated release of the information we contacted trusted journalists, activists, and hackers, preparing to flood the internet with the files. The goal was to create a media storm that Eclipse couldn't suppress. The day of the release, tension hung in the air. We sat in the basement, watching as the files were uploaded to multiple platforms and sent to news outlets around the world. Within hours, the story was trending and people were starting to take notice. Hashtags like hash expose eclipse and hash project eclipse were all over social media, but we knew it wouldn't be that easy. Eclipse was powerful and they would fight back with everything they had. We prepared for the worst, setting up contingency plans and securing the safe house. Then the backlash began Media outlets started retracting their stories, claiming the files were fake. 
social media accounts sharing the information were suspended. It was clear Eclipse was pulling strings, trying to discredit us and bury the truth. But something unexpected happened. People didn't believe the retractions. They had seen too much, and the sheer volume of evidence made it hard to dismiss. Independent journalists and citizen reporters started digging deeper, uncovering more about Eclipse and their nefarious activities. The story wasn't going away. One night, as we were monitoring the situation, there was a loud bang outside. We jumped to our feet, grabbing our weapons. The door burst open and armed men stormed in. We fought back, but they overpowered us, dragging us outside. As I was thrown into a van, I saw Sarah struggling against her captors. Our eyes met for a brief moment, and I saw a mix of fear and determination in her gaze. The van door slammed shut, plunging us into darkness. They drove for hours, taking us to an unknown location. When the van finally stopped, we were dragged out and taken into a large ominous building. It looked like a repurposed industrial facility, cold and sterile. We were separated and I was taken to an interrogation room similar to the one where Mr. Black had questioned me. I was strapped to a chair and a bright light shone in my face. A figure stepped forward and my heart sank. It was Mr. Black. Mr. Anderson, he said with a sinister smile. We meet again. I see you've been busy. I glared at him, refusing to show fear. You won't get away with this. People know the truth now. He chuckled, shaking his head. You're naive. The truth is malleable, easily manipulated. But don't worry, you won't be around to see how this plays out. The door opened and two men walked in, carrying a tray of instruments. I braced myself for another round of torture, but Mr. Black held up a hand. Not this time, he said. We have something different in mind. They injected me with something and the world started to blur. My body felt heavy, my thoughts becoming fuzzy. As I drifted into unconsciousness, I heard Mr. Black's voice. Welcome to phase two of Project Eclipse. I woke up in a different room, still strapped to a chair. My head throbbed and my vision was blurry. Sarah was next to me, unconscious but alive. Relief washed over me, but it was short-lived. The door opened and a group of scientists walked in, followed by Mr. Black. Good to see you're awake, he said. You're about to become part of something much bigger than you can imagine. They started explaining their plan, but my mind was still foggy. From what I could gather, they intended to use us as test subjects for a new phase of their mind control technology. They believed our resistance to their previous methods made us ideal candidates. As they prepped the equipment, I tried to think of a way out, but the drugs in my system made it hard to focus. Desperation clawed at me as they strapped us to machines, electrodes attached to our heads. This is the beginning of a new era, Mr. Black said, watching with a twisted sense of satisfaction. And you, Mr. Anderson, will be one of the first to experience it. The machines hummed to life and pain exploded in my head. I tried to scream but no sound came out. My thoughts became jumbled, memories blending with nightmares. I felt my sense of self slipping away, replaced by an overwhelming urge to comply, to obey. But somewhere deep inside, a small part of me fought back. I clung to that fragment of resistance, refusing to let go. The world around me faded, but that spark remained a beacon of hope in the darkness. As the machines continued their work, I knew one thing for certain. This wasn't the end. The fight against Eclipse would go on, and I would find a way to break free, to stop them once and for all. 
even if it meant sacrificing everything. I don't know how long I was under their control. Time became meaningless, a blur of pain and confusion. But that small spark inside me, that shred of resistance, never went out. I held onto it, waiting for a moment of weakness in their system, a chance to fight back. Then one day, it happened. I was in a cell, my mind foggy from the drugs they used to keep me compliant. But there was a sudden power outage. The lights flickered, and the hum of the machine ceased. It was a brief window, but it was enough. I forced myself to focus, pushing through the haze. The door to my cell was unlocked, likely a result of the outage. I stumbled out, my legs weak, but determination fueling every step. I had to find Sarah. I moved through the corridors, avoiding the few guards who were scrambling to address the power failure. Eventually, I found her in a lab, strapped to one of their infernal machines. Her eyes were closed, but she was alive. I rushed to her side, disconnecting the electrodes and gently shaking her awake. Sarah, we have to go. Her eyes fluttered open and recognition dawned. Jack? She whispered, her voice weak. Yeah, it's me. Come on, we need to move. She nodded and I helped her to her feet. We made our way through the facility, relying on the confusion caused by the outage. It seemed like a stroke of luck, but deep down I knew Eclipse's grip was still strong. We had to act fast. We reached the main control room, where a cluster of computers displayed feeds from various parts of the facility. I found a terminal and accessed the system, using the knowledge I'd gained from our earlier encounters with Eclipse. Jack, what are you doing? Sarah asked, keeping an eye on the door. Sending everything to our contacts, I replied, typing furiously. They need to see what's really going on here. I uploaded the files from the control room to the network we'd established, sending them to trusted allies and broadcasting them on secure channels. It was a desperate move, but our only hope. As the files transferred, alarms blared, signaling the restoration of power. We were running out of time. Come on, I urged, grabbing Sarah's hand. We need to get out of here. We raced through the corridors, the sounds of guards closing in on us. We reached the exit, but our escape was blocked by a group of armed men. Among them was Mr. Black, his face twisted in a smug smile. Going somewhere, he taunted, raising a gun. I stepped in front of Sarah, ready to face whatever came next. But before Mr. Black could pull the trigger, a loud explosion rocked the building. The walls shook and smoke filled the corridor. In the chaos, I saw a familiar face. David, our ally from the safe house, leading a group of resistance fighters. They had breached the facility, taking advantage of the outage. Get down, David shouted, opening fire on the guards. We dropped to the floor as bullets flew overhead. The resistance fighters overwhelmed the guards, and soon the corridor was clear. David rushed to our side, helping us up. You two okay? He asked, concern etched on his face. Yeah, thanks to you, I replied, relief flooding through me. We need to move, David said, leading us out of the facility. We've got transport waiting. We followed him outside, where a van was waiting. We climbed in, and the van sped away, leaving the facility behind. As we drove, I looked back, watching the building shrink into the distance. Did you get the files out? Sarah asked, leaning against me. Yeah, I said, squeezing her hand. They're out there now. Eclipses won't be able to hide anymore. David nodded, glancing at us from the front seat. The fight isn't over, but this is a huge blow to them. People are waking up, and the resistance is growing. For the first time 
in what felt like forever, I allowed myself a glimmer of hope. We had struck a significant blow against Eclipse, and while the road ahead would be long and dangerous, we were no longer alone. Months passed, and the information we'd released continued to spread. Whistleblowers came forward, adding to the mounting evidence against Eclipse. Governments were forced to address the scandal, and public outrage grew. Sarah and I remained in hiding, but we were more connected than ever to the resistance. We continued to gather intel, disrupt Eclipse's operations, and rally support. The fight was far from over, but we had started a movement that couldn't be stopped. One night, as we sat by a campfire in a remote hideout, Sarah looked at me with a mixture of exhaustion and determination. Do you think we'll ever be able to live normal lives again? She asked. I wrapped an arm around her, pulling her close. Maybe someday, but for now, we keep fighting. For everyone who can't. She nodded, resting her head on my shoulder. We'll make it. Together. As the fire crackled and the stars shone above, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. We had faced unimaginable horrors, but we had survived. And as long as we drew breath, we would continue to fight against the darkness of Project Eclipse. Because sometimes, all it takes is a single spark to ignite a revolution. I found something worse than the dark web. It's called the black web. Don't visit it. You have been warned. Hey everyone, I'm using a throwaway account for this because I don't want this traced back to me. What I'm about to tell you is something I deeply regret getting involved in. And if you have any sense, you'll stay far away from it. This isn't just some urban legend or another creepy pasta. This is real. And it's dangerous. So, I've always been a bit of a thrill seeker. Not the jump out of planes kind, but more like diving into the weird and dark corners of the internet. I've spent hours on forums, dark net markets, and all the creepy, strange places the web has to offer. The dark web became like a second home to me. It was fascinating, dangerous sure, but nothing I couldn't handle, or so I thought. A few months ago, I came across a post on a forum I frequent. It was buried deep in a thread about conspiracy theories and urban legends. The title was simple, The Black Web, not for the faint of heart. There were no replies, no upvotes, just this lonely post sitting there daring someone to click on it. And of course, I did. The post was short and to the point. It claimed that there was something deeper and darker than the dark web. A hidden layer of the internet that even seasoned dark net users didn't know about. It was called the black web. The instructions were vague and cryptic, talking about special browsers and encrypted keys. There was a warning at the end. Do not attempt to access the black web unless you are prepared for what you might find. Naturally, my curiosity got the better of me. I followed the instructions, which led me on a wild goose chase through a series of encrypted messages and shadowy contacts. It took weeks, but eventually I got what I needed. A custom built browser and a key an actual physical key, delivered to my door in a plain envelope. There was no return address, no note, nothing. I'll admit, I hesitated, but after all that effort, I wasn't going to back out now. I fired up my computer, launched the browser, and inserted the key. The screen went black for a moment, then filled with a mess of code. Slowly, a new interface took shape. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Stark, minimal, and deeply unsettling. The main page was a simple black background 
with a single search bar and a list of categories. Experiments, human, otherworldly, forbidden knowledge. My heart was pounding, but I felt a thrill too. I clicked on experiments first. The screen flickered and then a list of links appeared. Some were in languages I didn't recognize. Others were just strings of numbers and letters. I picked one at random. It led to a page with a video player. The thumbnail was dark and grainy, but I could make out a figure in the center. I clicked play. The video was shaky, filmed on a handheld camera in what looked like a basement. The figure in the center was a person tied to a chair with a bag over their head. The audio was muffled, but I could hear breathing, heavy, panicked breathing. I felt a knot form in my stomach as a second figure entered the frame. They were dressed in black, face obscured by a mask. They spoke softly, too quietly to hear. Then without warning, they pulled the bag off the person's head. The victim was sobbing, begging for mercy. I froze, unable to look away as the masked figure began to methodically cut into the person's flesh, all the while speaking in that same soft voice. I won't go into the details of what happened next. It's enough to say that it was the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. And the worst part, the person filming turned the camera on themselves at the end. They removed their mask and I saw their face. It was expressionless almost bored as they stared into the camera and whispered, Welcome to the black web. I slammed my laptop shut and sat there in the dark, trying to process what I'd just seen. My heart was racing, my skin clammy with sweat, but the nightmare was far from over. My phone buzzed on the desk beside me. A new message. It was from an unknown number. The text was short and to the point. Keep watching. I should have stopped there. I should have smashed my computer, burned the key, and forgotten all about the black web. But I didn't. My curiosity, my need to know, pulled me back in. I told myself it was just a sick prank. A fake video meant to scare idiots like me. So, I opened my laptop again and went back to the black web. This time, I clicked on human. The links here were more disturbing. Titles like Harvesting, The Dollhouse, and Lost Children. My hands were shaking as I clicked on a link titled Room 666. It led to a live feed. A dimly lit room with a single chair in the center. The walls were covered in strange symbols, painted in what looked like blood. The room was empty, but the feed was live broadcasting in real time. I watched, waiting for something to happen. Minutes passed, then an hour. Just as I was about to give up, the door in the video creaked open. A person was shoved into the room, blindfolded and gagged. They were trembling, stumbling as they tried to find their footing. The door slammed shut behind them and a voice came over the feed, deep, mechanical, distorted. Welcome to room 666. Survive the night and you are free. The person in the room started to cry, their voice muffled by the gag. I watched in horror as the symbols on the walls began to glow, pulsing with a sickly red light. Shadows moved in the corners of the room, creeping closer to the terrified person. The voice spoke again chanting in a language I didn't understand. The shadows took form, twisted, monstrous figures that defied explanation. I wanted to look away, to close the browser and pretend none of this was happening, but I couldn't. I was trapped, just like the person in that room. The feed went on for hours, showing every gruesome detail of what those shadows did. When it finally ended, the room was empty again. The only trace of what had happened 
was the blood smeared on the floor and walls. I sat back, numb, my mind racing. This was no prank, no twisted movie set. It was real, and I was in way over my head. Part 2 is coming soon, but please, if you're reading this, heed my warning. Stay away from the black web. It's not worth it. I didn't sleep that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those shadows, that room, the terror on that person's face. I kept hearing that voice, chanting in that incomprehensible language. My room felt colder, the darkness thicker, as if something was watching me from the corners. But despite the fear, despite the sick feeling in my gut, I couldn't stop thinking about the black web. I knew I should have destroyed the key, deleted the browser, and moved on with my life. But there was something in me that needed to understand what I had stumbled upon. I needed answers. So the next day, I went back online, trying to find anyone who knew anything about the black web. I posted on forums, reached out to darknet contacts, even tried the original poster on that forum. Most people had never heard of it. Those who had either dismissed it as a myth or warned me to stay away. Then I got a private message from someone with the username Watcher in the Dark. The message was brief. I know what you're looking for. Meet me in the chat room at 2 a.m. alone. I hesitated. This could easily be a trap, but I had to know more. I logged into the chat room at the appointed time, my heart pounding in my chest. A single message popped up. You're curious. That's dangerous. I typed back. I need to know what's going on. What is the black web? The response was almost immediate. The black web is the darkest part of the internet. It's where the worst of humanity resides. It's not just criminals or perverts. It's something much worse, something ancient. The site you accessed is just a doorway. There are things there that defy explanation, things that should not exist in our world. I felt a chill run down my spine. What kind of things? The answer came slowly, as if the person on the other end was choosing their words carefully. Rituals, sacrifices, forbidden knowledge, the black web is a place where reality breaks down. It's not just another layer of the internet. It's a gateway to something else, something evil. I stared at the screen, trying to process what I was reading. Why are you telling me this? Because you need to understand what you're dealing with. I was like you once, curious, reckless. I went too far, and now I'm trapped. I can't leave, but maybe I can help you avoid the same fate. I felt a pang of fear and pity for this person. What do you mean trapped? I'm part of it now. They watch me, control me. The black web is alive, and once you're in, it doesn't let go. It's not too late for you. Destroy the key, delete everything, and never look back. I wanted to believe this was just another scare tactic another way to mess with me, but something in their words felt genuine, desperate. I thanked them and logged off, my mind racing. If what they said was true, I was playing with something far more dangerous than I'd ever imagined, but I couldn't just walk away. Not yet. I needed to see for myself. I told myself it would be the last time. One more visit, and then... I'd destroy everything. That night, I plugged in the key and opened the browser. The familiar black screen greeted me, and I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead. I navigated to the forbidden knowledge section. This time, I was greeted with a single link titled, The Abyss Stares Back. I hesitated, my finger hovering over the mouse. Then I clicked. The page that loaded was different from the others. It was filled with strange symbols, diagrams, and texts in languages I couldn't recognize. 
In the center was a video player, just like before. The thumbnail was an old book, its cover worn and cracked. The title was in Latin, Liber Tenebris. I clicked play. The video began with a hooded figure, their face hidden in shadow, holding the book. They spoke in a low, gravelly voice, the language ancient and foreign. As they chanted, the symbols on the page began to glow, and the air around them seemed to distort, like heat waves rising from the asphalt. The camera zoomed in on the book, and I could see the text shifting, the letters rearranging themselves into new forms. It was like the book was alive, its contents changing with the chant. The figure's voice grew louder, more intense, and I felt a pressure in my ears, a rising sense of dread. Then the figure looked up, and though I couldn't see their eyes, I felt their gaze pierce through the screen, straight into me. The chanting stopped, and for a moment there was silence. Then the figure spoke in English, their voice echoing unnaturally. You have seen too much. There is no turning back. The screen went black, and my computer shut down. I sat there trembling, my mind reeling. What had I just witnessed? Was it a ritual? A spell? I didn't know, but I could feel the wrongness of it, the sense that I had crossed a line. My phone buzzed again, another message from the unknown number. Now you understand. There is no escape. I felt a wave of panic. I threw my phone across the room and ran to my computer, trying to restart it. It wouldn't turn on. I yanked the key out and smashed it with a hammer, my hands shaking. I felt like I was losing my mind. I wanted out, but it felt like it was too late. I spent the rest of the night in my living room, every light in the house on, clutching a kitchen knife. The shadows seemed to move, to creep closer. I kept hearing whispers, seeing flickers of movement out of the corner of my eye. By dawn, I was exhausted, my nerves frayed, but I knew one thing. I couldn't stop now. I had to find a way to end this. Part 3 is coming soon. If you've made it this far, please take this seriously. Stay away from the black web. Don't let curiosity drag you into the abyss. I didn't go to work the next day. I called in sick and spent the day researching everything I could about the black web, the symbols I had seen, and the book in the video. Most of what I found was fragmented, obscure references in old texts and forums filled with theories and speculations. Nothing concrete but all of it deeply unsettling. Every now and then, I'd hear a whisper or catch a glimpse of a shadow moving where there shouldn't be one. It felt like the black web was seeping into my reality, and the more I read, the more I felt it pulling me back. It wasn't just fear anymore. It was an obsession. Around midday, I got a message on my computer from an old darknet contact someone I trusted. They asked if I was okay, saying they'd seen me posting about the black web and were worried. I told them everything, what I'd seen, what I'd experienced. They went silent for a long time before replying. You need to get out of your house. Now. I stared at the screen, my heart racing. Why? Because you've been marked. They know where you are. If you stay, They'll come for you. I didn't need to be told twice. I grabbed my laptop, some clothes, and left. I didn't know where I was going. I just needed to be somewhere else. I checked into a cheap motel on the edge of town, somewhere I hoped would be off the radar. That night, I couldn't sleep. The whispers were louder, the shadows darker. I felt like I was being watched, hunted, I sat in the corner of the room, my back to the wall, knife in hand. Around 3 a.m., I heard footsteps outside my door, slow and deliberate. 
They stopped just outside, and for a moment, everything was silent. Then a voice, deep and mechanical, like the one from the video, spoke through the door. You can't run. You belong to us now. I froze, my grip on the knife tightening. The door handle rattled, but it didn't open. I didn't move, didn't breathe. After what felt like hours, the footsteps moved away, fading into the distance. I stayed awake until morning, my eyes never leaving the door. When the sun finally rose, I felt a small measure of relief. I knew I couldn't keep running. I needed help. I reached out to watch her in the dark again, desperate for any advice. They responded quickly. Meet me in person. There's a way to fight back, but you need to be prepared for the consequences. We arranged to meet at a secluded park later that day. I was paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder, but I made it there without incident. Watcher in the dark turned out to be a woman in her late thirties, looking as haunted as I felt. She introduced herself as Sarah. We don't have much time, she said, glancing around nervously. They'll be watching. She handed me a small leather-bound book, similar to the one in the video, but different. This is a grimoire. It has rituals, protections, ways to fight back. But it's dangerous. You have to be careful. I took the book, feeling its weight in my hands. Why are you helping me? She sighed. Because I've been where you are. I got out, but not without a price. They'll never stop coming for you, but you can make it harder for them. You can fight back. I felt a spark of hope. What do I need to do? She pointed to the book. There's a ritual in there, a way to sever their connection to you. It's not easy, and it's not without risk, but it's your best shot. We went over the ritual in detail. It involved a lot of preparation, symbols, candles, chants. It felt surreal, like something out of a horror movie, but I was willing to try anything. Sarah warned me that the ritual would draw them to me, that it would be a fight for my life. That night, I went back to the motel and prepared. I drew the symbols, lit the candles, and started the chant. As I spoke the words, I felt the air grow thick. The temperature drop. The shadows in the room seemed to come alive, writhing and twisting. Then they appeared. Figures, just like in the videos. Dark, monstrous shapes that defied logic and reason. They surrounded me, their whispers filling the room, drowning out my voice. I fought to keep chanting, my eyes fixed on the grimoire, my heart pounding in my chest. One of the figures lunged at me, and I felt a sharp pain as it slashed across my arm. Blood dripped onto the symbols, and the figures recoiled, hissing. I kept chanting, louder, forcing my voice to drown out theirs. The room shook, the shadows writhed, and the figures grew more frantic. Finally, with one last shout, I completed the ritual. The room exploded with light, and the figures screamed, a sound that pierced my very soul. Then just as suddenly, it was over. The shadows vanished. The room fell silent, and I collapsed to the floor, exhausted and bleeding. I don't remember much after that. I woke up in the hospital, my arm bandaged, my body aching. The doctors said I'd been found unconscious in my motel room. The door locked from the inside. They didn't know how I'd been injured, but I was lucky to be alive. Sarah visited me a few days later. You did it, she said, a small smile on her lips. You broke their hold on you, but you need to be careful. They'll still be watching, waiting for any chance to pull you back in. I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and lingering fear. I knew my life would never be the same but at least I had a fighting chance. 
I promised myself I'd never go near the black web again. Some things are better left in the dark, unseen and untouched. Part 4 is coming soon. If you're reading this, please, take my story as a warning. The black web is real. And it's deadly. Stay away for your own sake. Recovering in the hospital, I had plenty of time to reflect on everything that had happened. The encounter with those dark figures, the ritual, Sarah's warnings. It all felt like a surreal nightmare. But the scars on my arm and the lingering sense of dread reminded me it was all too real. When I was finally discharged, I went home, but my house no longer felt safe. Every creak, every shadow seemed sinister. I kept the grimoire close, my only source of comfort. Sarah had told me it contained other rituals, protections, banishments, but she warned me to use them sparingly. The more you interact with that world, the more you attract its attention, she had said. Despite my resolve to stay away, curiosity gnawed at me. I wanted to understand more about what I'd encountered, about the entities that had almost killed me. I started reading the grimoire, not to perform rituals, but to learn. It was a dense, difficult text, filled with archaic language and cryptic illustrations. But the more I read, the more I realized just how deep and dark the Black Web's roots went. Weeks passed. I kept to myself, avoiding the internet as much as possible. But then the dream started. Vivid, horrifying nightmares where I was back in room 666 or facing those shadowy figures again. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, the whispers from my dreams echoing in my ears. I knew I couldn't handle this alone anymore. I reached out to Sarah again. She agreed to meet, this time at her place. Her home was filled with protective charms, symbols etched into the walls and various herbs hanging from the ceiling. She had clearly taken great pains to keep herself safe. We sat in her kitchen, a heavy silence between us. The dreams won't stop, I admitted. I feel like they're trying to drag me back. She nodded, her expression serious. They are. Once you touch that world, it's hard to completely break free. The best you can do is protect yourself and resist their pull. We spent the day going over more advanced protections, rituals to cleanse my home and ward off the entities. Sarah showed me how to create barriers using salt, herbs, and symbols from the grimoire. It was exhausting, both physically and mentally, but it gave me a sense of control. That night, I performed the cleansing ritual at home. I sprinkled salt in every corner, burned sage, and drew protective symbols on the walls and doors. As I worked, I felt a strange sense of calm. For the first time in weeks, the shadows seemed less oppressive. The whispers faded. But as I finished the last symbol, my phone buzzed. A message from an unknown number. You can't hide forever. My heart raced. I showed the message to Sarah, who frowned. They're persistent, I'll give them that, but as long as you keep your protection strong, they can't harm you. Days turned into weeks, and while the dreams became less frequent, the sense of being watched never fully left. I started to rebuild my life, slowly reconnecting with friends and returning to work, but I kept my experiences a secret. Who would believe me anyway? One night, as I was reading through the grimoire, I found a section I hadn't noticed before. It was about severing ties with dark entities permanently. The ritual was complex, requiring rare ingredients and precise timing, but it promised a way to close the door to the black web for good. I called Sarah immediately. I think I found something that can end this once and for all. She came over and we went through the ritual together. 
it required a special night, one where the moon was in a specific phase and a location with strong natural energies. We chose a secluded forest outside of town, a place where the veil between worlds was thin. On the appointed night, we gathered the ingredients and drove out to the forest. The moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie glow through the trees. We set up in a clearing, drawing a large circle on the ground and placing candles at its points. As we began the ritual, the air grew cold and the forest around us fell silent. I could feel a presence watching, waiting. We chanted the words from the grimoire, a powerful incantation to sever the ties that bound me to the black web. The candles flickered, the shadows danced, and for a moment I felt a crushing pressure, as if the entire world was closing in on me. Then, with a final shout, we completed the ritual. The pressure lifted, and the air seemed to shimmer. For the first time in what felt like forever, I felt a sense of peace. Sarah and I sat in the clearing, exhausted but relieved. It's done, she said, a faint smile on her lips. You've severed the connection. They won't be able to reach you now. I felt a weight lift from my shoulders. It was over. I thanked Sarah, knowing I owed her my life. We packed up and left the forest, the moonlight guiding us back to the car. As we drove back to town, I felt a strange mix of emotions, relief, exhaustion, and a lingering fear that it might not be over. But I chose to believe in the ritual, in the protections we had set up. Part 5 is coming soon. If you've followed my story this far, thank you. And remember, the black web is not something to be taken lightly. Stay away from it, protect yourself, and never ever let curiosity drag you into its depths. In the weeks following the ritual in the forest, life began to normalize. The dreams became less frequent and less vivid. The whispers faded to a distant memory, and the shadows no longer seemed to watch me with malevolent intent. I cautiously returned to my routines, slowly rebuilding my shattered sense of security. Sarah and I kept in touch, and I found solace in our shared experiences and her ongoing support. But then, one night, everything changed. It was a quiet evening. I was at home, reading, when my phone buzzed. Another message from an unknown number. We are not finished. My blood ran cold. I showed the message to Sarah, who immediately came over. We fortified the house with additional protections doubling our efforts to keep whatever was out there at bay. That night, I slept uneasily. The sense of being watched returned, stronger than ever. Around 3 a.m., a loud crash woke me. I bolted upright, grabbing the knife I kept by my bed. The sound had come from downstairs. Heart pounding, I crept towards the noise, every step echoing in the silence. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I saw it. The front door was wide open, the salt lines disturbed, shadows moved in the hallway, and the temperature dropped sharply. I could hear whispers growing louder and more insistent. They were here. Suddenly, the air around me grew thick, oppressive. I felt a presence, a dark energy that seemed to seep into my very soul. The shadows coalesced into figures, just like the ones I had seen before. They surrounded me, their whispers forming a cacophony of incomprehensible words. In a panic, I called out for Sarah, hoping she was still nearby. The shadows lunged at me, and I swung the knife wildly, the blade passing through them as if they were smoke. Just as one of the figures reached for me, Sarah burst into the room, chanting a powerful incantation from the grimoire. The shadows recoiled, hissing, but they didn't retreat. Sarah and I stood back to back, 
her voice steady and strong as she continued the chant. I joined her, my voice trembling but determined. The air vibrated with energy, the symbols we had drawn earlier glowing faintly in the darkness. As we chanted, the figures seemed to weaken, their forms flickering, but then the deep mechanical voice from my nightmares boomed through the house. You cannot escape us. You belong to the black web. With renewed intensity, the shadows surged forward. I felt their cold grip on my arms, their whispers clawing at my mind. Desperation took hold, and I remembered a passage from the grimoire about invoking a higher power for protection. It was a last resort, a dangerous gamble. I shouted the invocation, calling upon a name that had been buried in the ancient text. The effect was immediate. The air crackled with electricity, and a blinding light filled the room. The shadows screamed, a sound that shook the walls and began to disintegrate, their forms unraveling into nothingness. When the light faded, the house was silent. The oppressive presence was gone. The shadows banished. Sarah and I stood there, panting, our bodies shaking from the effort. It was over, truly over. In the aftermath, Sarah and I fortified our protections even further, ensuring that the connection to the black web was completely severed. I changed my number, moved to a new place, and started therapy to deal with the trauma. Sarah continued to help others like us, guiding them away from the dark corners of the internet and the dangers they held. As I slowly rebuilt my life, I remained vigilant. I knew that the black web was always there, lurking, waiting for another curious soul to fall into its trap. But I also knew that I had faced its horrors and survived. I had learned the importance of boundaries, of respecting the darkness and knowing when to walk away. If you've read my story, I hope you take my warnings to heart. The Black Web is not a myth or a game. It's a real malevolent force that preys on curiosity and recklessness. Stay away from it, protect yourself and your loved ones. And remember, some doors are meant to stay closed. Thank you for following my journey. Stay safe, stay vigilant, and never let the darkness pull you in.